we start off uh, with the um, with the first keynote speaker, and um, that's uh, Antonella Sorace. Antonella is professor of developmental linguistics at the University of Edinburgh, and she told me not to uh, pamper her up, so to not uh, to say too much about uh, her because she'll tell us about her personal story. I just wanted to say Antonella is also one of the founders of uh, bilingualism, Met bilingualism Matters. Uh, who's a network of researchers who uh, work on multilingualism and, uh, across different countries. So Antonella, when you're ready, we, um, you can share your slides and we can uh, start. Yes, I would like to share my slides, uh, uh, Francesca, if, I, if, I, if you can enable me. Right. Can you see my slides? Yeah, very well. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you so much then. Um, thank you for the invitation. I'm, uh, I'm sorry I can't be with you in person. I'm, I'm actually in Crete at the moment where I'm working very intensively. So I won't be able to attend the other talks, but I, I look forward to uh, catching up with them uh, online, given that they will be, uh, they will be recorded. Um, so uh, uh, I'm, I'm really delighted to be, uh, to be with you today. Um, and uh, I'll, uh, I've been asked to be partly autobiographical in my presentation, which is what I'm, uh, I'm planning to do. Um, uh, and uh, obviously, uh, I have no uh, uh, certainty uh, or conclusive evidence uh, in, uh, in, in saying that uh, my own personal experience uh, mattered uh, for uh, for my academic career or for my uh, public engagement career, uh, obviously uh, it can't be demonstrated that <laughs> I, uh, it, without my language learning experience, um, I would have ended up doing doing what I'm doing. Uh, but I think there are some uh, some clear connections, and I think you know my personal experience can provide a general context for my own research on on multilingualism uh, that, um, that I'm going to, uh, uh, to talk about briefly uh, shortly. Um, my slides will be uh, very uh, full of images rather than text. Um, so I hope, uh, I hope this is okay. And I hope you can uh, uh, hear me well um, uh, because uh, we had some problems with the connection here in Crete. Um, so uh, I'll, uh, I'll start from some biographical notes, uh, as, uh, as I said, but before I do that, this is what I'm basically going to cover. Um, I'll start from bi biographical notes about the way I, I grew up as a multilingual speaker. Um, and then, you know, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, briefly talk about my own research about bi bilingualism or multilingualism, so more than one language not necessarily only two over the lifespan, um, but also uh, 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 my attention uh, on uh, linguistic diversity and systematic variation. I'm a linguist by training. I define myself as an experimental linguist. Um, and so uh, some of the work that I've done uh, originated from multilingualism, uh, but then extended to uh, a better, uh, a better uh, a picture about certain areas of language um, that I'm, I'm going to briefly mention later. Um, and I'm also, uh, I, I'm, I'm also uh, interested and very aware about uh, of the natural variation, the natural differentiation of the bilingual experience. This is a topic that I'm sure my colleagues will, will talk about uh, in more detail uh, later today and uh, possibly tomorrow as well. So the bilingual experience being along a continuum uh, defined by variation in terms of experience. So it's not the case that you're either bilingual or not. Uh, you can be 
being bilingual to different degrees, depending on the kind of experience. Um, and I'm going to also briefly mention my one of the topics of my research, which is uh, the changes in the native language of people who learn another language. Again, this is also my personal experience, but I'm doing I'm doing research on understanding uh, these kind of changes in the native language, which are, as we'll see, absolutely normal, selective, and predictable. Uh, and finally, um, I'm going to say something about the need uh, for interdisciplinarity in research. I'm aware that I'm preaching to the converted. Uh, I, uh, you know, uh, all of you, uh, most of you are very aware of this. Um, uh, but uh, uh, in, in my own uh, uh, career, uh, I'm also uh, very engaged in science communication. Uh, and so uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm doing interdisciplinary research, but I'm also trying to pull together different threads, not only across disciplines, but also between research and society. So some biographical notes very, very briefly. Um, I'm Italian, as you can probably tell uh, uh, from uh, my name uh, and possibly my accent. Um, I was born in the Veneto area, which is uh, in the northeast of Italy. I was born in Padova, uh, precisely. Um, but my parents were uh, from the two main islands in Italy. My mother was from Sardinia and my father was from Sicily. Um, so uh, this is important as, uh, as we'll see in a, in a minute. So particularly because um, my mother, uh, although we didn't live in Sardinia, my mother spoke Sardinian, which is the local language, the language spoken in the island, um, but she decided not to speak to me in Sardinian uh, because like many people nowadays, she thought that Sardinian is not very useful as a language and I had to learn standard Italian first and then English because English is the useful language. And she thought that having Sardinian in the background would, uh, uh, would make me less able to learn these important languages. Um, and which is precisely the opposite of what we know uh, on the basis of research. But this was my personal experience. So I heard enough Sardinian in the background because she spoke it with other relatives, other members of the family, but not to me. So I can understand Sardinian. I have, uh, if you want, passive competence in Sardinian, but I can't use it. Um, it's interesting, and I would like to say this now, that uh, for a long time, I defined myself as a monolingual speaker of Italian. But in fact, I'm not a monolingual speaker of Italian. I didn't grow up as a monolingual speaker of Italian because I had this uh, language in the background that I didn't actively speak, but definitely uh, made me uh, not monolingual. So in terms of uh, current research, uh, even when I was a, a young child and then an adolescent, I wasn't monolingual because I had passive competence in Sardinian. Then I learned um, uh, foreign languages. I learned. I started learning English at the, at the age of eleven, and then I learned. Uh, uh, started learning French at the age of eighteen, and German at the age of twenty twenty one. So uh, I'm uh, I'm fairly fluent. I'm fluent in English because, as I'll see, you'll see in a minute, I have to work in English. I live in an English-speaking country. I'm still fluent in French. Uh, I'm less fluent in German. German never reached a very high level. And then um, I uh, uh, moved uh, out of Italy. Um, and uh, I moved, uh, well, I moved to various places. I moved to the uh, United States of America. I got a master's in California, but then I went to Scotland 
to Edinburgh to do a PhD first, and then um, I had a temporary job, and then the job became permanent. So I've been living in Scotland, in Edinburgh, for uh, more than 30 years, so uh, it's uh, quite uh, quite a long time. English is the language that I use uh, for work, obviously. I, I teach in English, I interact in English. I also uh, married uh, an American uh, man. Um, some of you may know him, uh, Bob Lard. He allowed me to make to make his name. He's a linguist, um, and uh, so he's a, he's a native speaker of American English. He's a real polyglot. He spoke some Italian even before we uh, we met, uh, and uh, we had two children. Um, who uh, uh, grew up bilingual. So I have experience in raising bilingual children. My children uh, learned obviously both Italian and English. Uh, they were exposed to different varieties of English, both American English uh, from their father, but also British English, or if you want, you know, Scottish English uh, from the general from the general environment. Uh, and uh, and so we adopted various methods to uh, um, to uh, raise our children bilingual. I can come back to this later if any of you is interested. So. Uh, that's my uh, my my biographical uh, background. And clearly, you know, languages have always been uh, uh, at the center of my life, one way or another. Um, and that's why I became interested in multilingualism. I became interested in understanding, first of all, how people learn second languages. So my original interest was on second language acquisition um, uh, by adults who already have a, a, a language, at least one language. Um, but then I moved on, I did, uh, I started doing research on child bilingualism as well, and uh, uh, more recently also on um, language learning in much older people, uh, people in their retirement years. Um, so really, uh, I'm interested in learning, you know, language learning, multilingualism over the lifespan, and I use the term multilingualism in a broad sense, as I said at the beginning, to refer to more than one language. Um, so, uh, and this is a relatively new uh, policy uh, tendency in our field, because for a long time we had separate fields, a separate field on second language acquisition in adults, a field on child by bilingualism in children. And the term bilingualism tended to be uh, uh, reserved to children who acquire more than one language from birth. But now, increasingly, we're using it as a general term to denote more than one language, regardless of when, at what age, uh, they, uh, they're actually, uh, actually learned. Um, so, in fact, as I said, yeah, multilingualism at different ages, so in children uh, and in adults, and um, the particular aspect of uh, adult second language learning that I'm, uh, I'm interested in and I've done quite a lot of work on is ultimate attainment. So how far can you go when you start learning a language as an adult, um, well, mostly as a, as a young adult, but also as a, as a middle-aged adult or as, a, or as an older adult? So how, what kind of level uh, can you reach? Um, and uh, we do quite a lot of research in Edinburgh on so-called native-like speakers, previously called near native speakers, which is a term that I've abandoned because it denotes, you know, the impossibility to get to native like levels. Um, so you're near, if, if you're a near native, you're, you're not quite there. You're almost there, but not quite. And I think, you know, research actually shows that you can reach very high levels indeed, although there is a lot more variation uh, among adults uh, in adult second language learning compared to child uh, language learning and child bilingualism. Um, <clears throat> so uh, uh, so term, the term multilingualism to denote more than one language at different ages. And again, you know, having uh, had the experience of learning languages as, a, as, a, as an adolescent and then a, as a young adult, uh, I know something about the experience from a personal point of view. Uh, and I became sensitive to also the 
the differences that uh, can, be, can be seen. And having the experience as a mother of raising bilingual children also made, it, made me very uh, interested and sensitive to, um, to the context in which children uh, can, acquire, can acquire more than one language and what can be expected from children who acquire more than one language. And I'll come back to these points when we, uh, at the end of my presentation, when we talk about public engagement and communication, uh, communication to society. So I would say that multilingualism um, uh, uh, made me uh, uh, and can make in general, perhaps, uh, 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 researchers uh, in, uh, uh, sensitive to systematic linguistic diversity, systematic linguistic diversity, not random linguistic diversity. So languages are different and there are differences within languages, but they're not random. They follow particular systems um, and, uh, and uh, the natural variation that we find in languages, again, is not random. Uh, it can be defined. Uh, and uh, we can try to understand the limits of linguistic diversity and natural variation. So one field in which I've done quite a lot of research Again, starting from multilinguals and then moving on to, uh, if you want, monolinguals, although I don't like to use this term because, as we said, mo real monolinguals will come back to this uh, 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 perhaps don't exist anymore uh, uh, in the sense that, you know, people who don't hear any other language. Uh, but I started from bilinguals and then I moved on to broader generalizations about the use of auxiliaries, essere and avere, so be and have, in languages uh, like Italian, uh, but also in other languages like German, for example, that allows a choice of auxiliaries uh, in uh, uh, in uh, in perfect tenses, for example, and what I uh, I, I discovered is that there is a hierarchy uh, uh, of uh, verbs, types of verbs, semantic type of verbs that uh, either require an, one auxiliary or the other auxiliary in a in an almost categorical way, or they are more variable. So the extremes of the hierarchy that you see are the verbs that categorically Categorically require either be or have, so essere or avere in Italian. So verbs denoting change of location uh, almost categorically select be in a language like Italian. On the, the opposite end of the hierarchy, verbs denoting non-motional controlled processes almost categorically select have, so avere in a language like Italian. Uh, and the verbs in the middle are increasingly variable as you move towards the center of the, hier uh, the hierarchy. So verbs denoting the existence of state are the most variable. In, depending on the context, they can take either be or have. So there is plenty of research that has been done you know, following this idea of uh, the auxiliary selection hierarchy that can be actually extended to uh, what in linguistics call, we call anergativity and anaccusativity, leaving aside you know, definitions, but uh, auxiliary selection can be seen as a marker of anaccusativity versus anergativity. So it's not the only marker. So if we look at the other markers of anaccusativity and anergativity, we can see again this uh, broad hierarchy ranging from systematic verbs that systematically tend to show an accusative behavior and verbs that systematically tend to show an ergative behavior and then verbs in the middle that are increasingly variable if you move towards the center. So my work was initially concerned in, uh, with Italian, but I, I would like to say that uh, the work has been done on other languages that select auxiliaries. So German, for example, we found, and had, people have found uh, uh, similar uh, uh, hierarchies for the behavior of sein versus haben as, as auxiliaries. So, so this is an example of natural, you know, systematic variation in, uh, in natural languages. 
And um, uh, to, to go back to the point, you know, sensitivity to natural variability in the bilingual experience, uh, we know that this is, as I said, this has become a central point of research in bilingualism, understanding that, you know, you're not uh, either a bilingual or not. So uh, bilingualism is not a black or white kind of experience, but it can be placed along a continuum that ranges from less bilingual or meaningful minimally bilingual, if you want, to uh, uh, highly bilingual, you know, productively bilingual on the opposite extreme, and with lots of degrees in the middle defined by the natural variability in the bilingual experience. Uh, and that, besi besides this, has the important consequence that, uh, uh, we'll come back to this point, we should stop comparing bilinguals with monolinguals. And that comparison has been the basis of research on bilingualism for a long time, including my own research. So a group of bilinguals is compared with a group of monolinguals, and the groups are are homogeneous by definition, but in fact, you know, if you take into account this natural variation, uh, uh, this kind of comparison uh, doesn't really make sense. It doesn't make sense also because, as we'll see later, real, real monolinguals who only grow up with one language and only hear one language in the environment are getting more and more difficult to find. So, um, uh, a lot of research, and I'm sure my colleagues later will be talking about inhibitory control or executive functions. Inhibitory control is one aspect of executive functions, uh, and this is, you know, a broad term defining a, a set of cognitive processes that have been found to be influenced by bilingualism. So, uh, uh, just in the in the in in the uh, in the picture there, I'm speaking English to you, and I'm pushing away my Italian and the other languages I know, uh, so that I can minimize the interference from uh, from uh, uh, from the other languages I know. And I'm doing this because clearly it wouldn't be appropriate for me to switch, you know, back and forth from English to Italian. If I was in a different situation where that kind of chain is uh, normal or more allowed because everybody does it and everybody understands and speaks both languages, then I would do it. But right now, you know, I, English is the language that I'm using and I'm applying inhibitory control to the other. And just uh, an example, for those of you who are not really in this uh, in this domain, um, you know the the first uh, uh, table, the top table, yeah, this one. Uh, this is a classic test, you know, where you have to name the color of the ink in which the the word is written. So you just have to say blue, yellow, red, purple, black. And the word, what the word says, is very consistent with the color that you have to mention. Unlike in this one, where you have to say yellow, because that's the color of the ink, but the word says blue, and you can't help reading that, because we're all proficient readers, you have to say red, but uh, the word actually says, uh, says yellow. So you have to apply inhibition. And it has been found by several studies that bilinguals can be better at this kind of task. They can be better because linguistically, they have the experience of inhibiting the language or the languages not being used. And that is extended, generalized outside the language domain and leads to a better control of uh, a better inhibitory control in general. Now, um, uh, this uh, uh, area uh, has been found, you know, there are studies that don't find these results. But again, many of these studies, you know, are based on a comparison between bilinguals and monolinguals. Now, if we take into account the differences in the bilingual experience, then it becomes a more or less question rather than a yes or no, or a black or white question. Uh, and so there may be uh, settings that are more conducive, you know, to this kind of effect on inhibitory control and settings that are less 
conducive. So kinds of experiences that are more conducive and kinds of experiences that are less. Um, and this is actually something that comes out in, with respect to minority languages. So indigenous minority languages that are only spoken in certain places. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, if you compare, uh, studies have been done, I'm not giving you references uh, right now, but uh, obviously uh, if you're interested, I could. Um, but, uh, but it's interesting that uh, these effects on inhibitory control, so on the ability to uh, apply inhibitory control outside the language domain, uh, have been found in some uh, minority languages, but not in others. For example, Sardinian Italian, yes, the effect has been found. Gallic English, yes, the effect has been found. Frisian Dutch, yes and no, you know, it really is not very consistent. Welsh English, no, the effect hasn't been found. Scipio Greek, Greek, yes, the effect has been found. Catalan Spanish, yes, the effect has been found. Basque Spanish, no, the effect hasn't been found. Now, um, uh, uh, and again, you know, there are more and more studies, you know, so the picture is becoming, you know, less uh, uh, drastically oriented in one way, version or another. But um, why do we find, you know, these, uh, these differences? Well, because the bilingual experience in these contexts can be very different. So, uh, so does it matter if everybody understands both languages in the community? And so you don't have to apply a lot of inhibition to the language you're not currently using, uh, because you can count on the fact that everybody uh, uh, understands and speaks both languages, as opposed to context where the languages are really rigidly separated. And Sardinian Italian is one of these contexts where Sardinian tends to be spoken at home, Italian outside the home. Uh, and so, you know, in yeah, at home, uh, you apply inhibition, strong inhibition to Italian. Outside the home, you apply strong inhibition to Sardinian. Um, and that's different from other contexts, you know, where uh, this rigid separation of languages doesn't occur. So understanding, you know, the differences in the bilingual experience can help us to understand the variation in the results in, uh, in the generalizability of the effects outside the language domain. I mentioned changes in the first language. That's one of my, my main interest in uh, in, uh, in the domain, uh, in the field of bilingualism, partly because in a sense, you know, a, yeah, I'm experiencing changes in my native language due to the fact that I'm, I've been using a second language at this point for most of my life. Uh, but I haven't actually stopped speaking Italian. So it's not that uh, uh, I don't speak it anymore. Uh, I, I speak it, I, I spoke it, you know, on a regular basis to my children. I often travel, you know, I've been speaking, uh, you know, I may have many Italian friends. Uh, so uh, what, what, what can we, what can we say about the effects of a second language on the first language? For a long time, the whole field of second language acquisition was based on research on the effects of the first language on the second language, because of course, an adult second language learner has at least one language, their native language. And so much, most research was done on the effects of the first language on the second language. More recently though, uh, we are beginning to understand that there are effects in the other direction as well. So from the second language to the first language, I'm oversimplifying this because there may be a third language or a fourth language. And so we may be talking about the effects of a third language on the first or the effects of a fourth language on the second, if we're talking about polyglots and multilinguals. But to simplify things, you know, at the moment, you know, let's uh, focus on the effects of a second language on the first language. Um, and for a long time, these effects were regarded as erosion, loss, so, uh, you know, you lose aspects of your native language. This is also because originally research on what goes under the name of attrition, and the name says it all, right? I mean, attrition really denotes erosion and loss. Um, and uh, it's a, a, a term widely used in the field, and I keep using it today, but I'm trying to move away from it because of the negative connotations that don't always apply to the results that we get. But the original research on attrition was done uh, a century ago, starting you know, from populations 
who left their original country for need. They migrated to different countries uh, at the time when there were no cheap flights, no internet, no social media. And so keeping in touch with the original language was actually quite difficult. And so uh, uh, people really uh, stopped speaking their, their or hearing their native language. But this is a very different situation uh, today. So we don't talk about erosion anymore. We're talking about natural change due to language contact. So two languages in contact affect each other reciprocally, both within the same individual brain and also more generally in bilingual in, in communities. And these changes are very selective. So in first generation speakers, which is what I, I particularly study, partly maybe because I am a first generation migrant. And so, you know, um, I grew up, I, I fully acquired Italian. I grew up with Italian, some Sardinian in the background, as I said at the beginning, but mostly Italian. And so, uh, uh, you know, I'm a first generation speaker. I completely acquired Italian. Then I moved to a country where English is spoken. And what we see from research, not just mine, but also other people's, other colleagues, is that uh, for the, so there are certain aspects of language that are affected by uh, change, and the change leads to more variation. So, uh, for example, personal pronouns, um, so I, you, he, she, this, this, uh, this aspect of language is one of the first ones to be affected by change due to the presence of another language. Other aspects of, of, of grammar are not affected. So word order, for example, is, tends not to be affected, but personal pronouns are. And, uh, uh, and uh, as we will see in a second, um, uh, what bilingual speakers do, they tend to, in a language like Italian, where you can use, a, use the pronoun, but also drop the pronoun. And sometimes Italian is called you know, a pro-drop language or a null subject language, and other languages are like that. You can either drop the pronoun or use an overt pronoun. And bilingualism leads to using more overt pronouns than, uh, uh, than before. So there is uh, alternations between dropping a pronoun when it should be dropped, when it would be appropriate to drop it, and using an overt pronoun. So more variation in that sense. Um, and interestingly, this is also what we see in second language acquisition, in very proficient second language learners of Italian, we see remaining residual variation with respect to personal pronouns. Again, uh, leading to an overuse of the explicit, the overt subject. So we see a convergence between what happens in attrition, so changes in the native Italian, and what happens in non-native native Italian uh, in, in, a, in a situation of acquisition. So we are thinking that these are really two sides of the same coin. It should be studied together in the sense that, you know, attrition or changes in the first language might be functional to a good proficiency, high proficiency that can be reached in a second language. Um, and, uh, and in fact, there may be individual variation in this respect. So not everybody is the same. Remember, we're talking about variation in, in the bilingual experience. So some people might be better than others at reconfiguring their linguistic space in such a way that uh, the L1 and the L2 uh, come to be more similar to one another in a way that favors active bilingualism in a person. Whereas, you know, you may have at the opposite extreme, uh, uh, bilingual speakers who really tend to keep the two languages quite rigidly separated for a variety of reasons, and they don't really reach a very high level of proficiency in a second language. So this is an open question. You know, there's a whole field of research uh, on the convergence between uh, language changes in the first language and levels that can be reached in the second language. And um, when I talked about interdisciplinarity, um, we are actually looking, we, we uh, my, my research group, but also many other uh, researchers, uh, are looking beyond language. So this is uh, where, you know, bringing together uh, different uh, uh, intuitions from different uh, 
uh, uh, domains and different fields is very useful. So in order to use a pronoun appropriately in a language like Italian, for example, um, it's not enough to have a grammar, you can see in the left, that makes these possibilities available. So, you know, a proficient speaker obviously has that grammar. It ha they have that, this choice in the grammar. But every time they use a pronoun, they have to use it in a, in a way that is contextually appropriate. So so they have to judge, for example, whether, okay, am I talking about something that my interlocutor can understand? So am I referring to something that is uh, salient in context? In which case, I can drop a pronoun because it's clear, it's not ambiguous. If it's not clear, then I should use an overt pronoun, an explicit pronoun, or repeat a noun phrase. Uh, so there, 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 there are uh, what we can call, what I would call interface conditions that link grammar and grammatical choices to particular contexts, to particular pragmatic contexts that favor either one pronoun or the other. And that evaluation has to be done all the time. So it's not done once for all. You can't just in the morning decide, okay, today I'm going to use uh, null pronouns all the time, because it depends on who, you know, the situation, who you're talking to, what you're talking about, what the shared knowledge between you and your interlocutor is. And and this um, evaluation has to be updated all the time. So there are general cognitive uh, uh, factors that play a role in this context. And it's a matter of not only of language knowledge, but also of language processing. And this is where you know, collaboration between psycholinguists, uh, cognitive psychologists and linguists is particularly, uh, particularly useful. And in fact, one of the uh, trends that have been uh, uh, we've been pursuing is the fact that there may be a trade-off effect between the ability to inhibit. Remember, we mentioned this before: the ability to inhibit irrelevant languages, but also irrelevant information. Um, uh, so, having good inhibitory control and having good ability to integrate contextual information and update your general uh, evaluation of the general context. So uh, in a sense, you know, uh, and there is evidence in cognitive psychology about this, the better you are at inhibitory control, the less, the more valuable you can be at integrating an, uh, information and updating your evaluation of the situation. So uh, if you become, as a bilingual speaker, if you become very good that inhibitory control, you may be correspondingly less good or less consistently good at doing this kind of rapid integration that underlies the proficient use of pronouns in, in a language. Um, and so that leads to more variability in the use of pronouns uh, in bilinguals. And I would say particularly in late bilinguals, so adult bilinguals who already have a fully developed language, a, a language that needs to be inhibited more strongly than uh, the other language of a child by of an early bilingual who grew up with more than one language. Uh, uh, so uh, you might, we might find these trade-off effects more in adult bilinguals than in child, uh, in child or in early bilinguals. Uh, yeah, and this is an illustration of what I was talking about. You know, if you have an experiment where you know you have to say remember the word kite and ignore the word anchor, right? And then you're shown a trumpet. And obviously, you know, you can name trumpet, you know, very quickly because, you know, it has nothing to do with the other objects. But on the right, you know, if you have a situation where you say, remember kite and ignore trumpet, so you have to inhibit trumpet. And then in the next trial, trumpet is the word that you have to name you're slower at that. So this is kind of, you know, a trade-off. Again, if you're good at inhibiting, you know, you may be co correspondingly slower at naming the word that you just inhibited.
Now, these changes due to attrition or changes due to the presence of another language. Um, our hypothesis is that in first generation speakers like myself, for example, um, the grammar doesn't really change. What changes is the access to grammar and the processing, some aspects of processing the grammar, for example, the ones involved in the use of pronouns that require an interface between language and uh, pragmatics and context. So, uh, so attrition affects those uh, uh, phenomena in first generation. In second generation, it may be a different matter. So the Italian that my children got from me is not exactly the same Italian that I got when I was uh, growing up in Italy in an Italian environment. And so at this point, you know, they get, they get more variation from me in the use of pronouns, for example. At that point, they might actually incorporate some of these changes in their grammar. So, and this is where languages might start changing. It's not the only factor that leads to um, uh, change over time. We know that lively languages change. You know, the only languages that don't change anymore are dead. Uh, so, you know, Latin doesn't change anymore because it's a dead language. But if a language is alive, it changes. And this might be one of the factors that co uh, uh, contributes to systematic language changes. So the passage from first generation uh, bilingual migrants to uh, second generation and then third generation uh, where this variability that children are exposed to might actually become a change in their in their grammar and then subsequently it becomes really part of the grammar um, and remember that you know what the bilingual speakers do for pronouns they actually uh, it's not that they start using pronouns randomly they start overusing the explicit, the overt pronoun. And this might be due to another characteristic of bilingualism that has been studied quite a lot. Um, so there is an overuse, overuse of overt pronouns. So, so uh, repeating uh, Louis or lay, so he or her or she, when it's not necessary because it's clear who is the referent, who uh, uh, the pronoun refers to. So it would be appropriate to drop the pronoun, but there is an overuse of these overt pronouns. Well, this might be due to the fact that the overt pronoun is uh, generates in general, not always, but in general, generates redundancy. So, you know, it gener doesn't generate ambiguity. If you drop the pronoun when you shouldn't, it's not clear who you're referring to, who you're talking about. And so that uh, generates ambiguity. But if you use an overt pronoun when it's not appropriate, more than uh, often than not, that generates redundancy rather than uh, uh, ambiguity. And that might be also linked to the fact that um, it has been found in a research on bilingualism that bilingualism enhances perspective taking. So the sensitivity to the other person's perspective um, so, uh, and this is a developmental aspect in all children. All children have to reach that stage where they can actually uh, uh, are better able at seeing the other person's perspective. Um, uh, for uh, and bilingualism has been found to uh, anticipate that discovery developmentally by uh, about a year in bilingual children. In bilingual adults, it has been found that bilingualism can lead to a faster move from one's own egocentric perspective to another person's perspective. So it's not a developmental fact in adults, but it's more a question of fast process, fast moving from uh, one's own perspective to another person's perspective. So what does have to do with uh, this have to do with um, pronouns? Well, the use of the overt pronoun might actually be, you know, due to partly due to a sensitivity to the fact that, uh, you know, it, you better be, you know, avoid ambiguity, avoid unclarity, avoid, you know, being uh, more uh, uh, explicit than you need, in fact. Um, and so, you know, that leads to uh, uh, the use of, uh, of an overt pronoun. So again, you know, this uh, it's, it's just uh, 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 we need more research about all of these aspects, but this is another uh, a, a, a interesting
existing connection uh, between linguistic and, and cognitive effects. So we need inter interdisciplinarity in research, multiple approaches. Um, so if we keep being confined within our, you know, the safe boundaries of our own discipline, uh, uh, we may make progress, but, you know, especially for complex phenomena like bilingualism and multilingualism, but all the phenomena that uh, will be um, uh, obviously uh, uh, talked about during the conference, um, uh, uh, none of us is an expert in everything. And so it's important to be able to communicate across, across disciplinary boundary in a way way uh, that actually doesn't completely obliterate the blur the the the, the or blurs the, the 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 boundaries among disciplines I mean that doesn't make any sense but in a way that respects obviously the boundaries of each discipline but finds areas of intersection where productive uh, research can be done but where productive conclusions can be done on the basis of uh, disciplinary, interdisciplinary, interdisciplinarity rather than transdisciplinarity, which is another, another term that uh, is used uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the literature sometimes. So, uh, uh, which is not always easy, of course, you know, it requires uh, the willingness, obviously, to collaborate across disciplines, but also a willingness to find areas of interaction and intersection that favor uh, uh, productive collaboration um, and as I said at the beginning, you know, now one of the things that we understand more and more in the field of multilingualism, research on multilingualism, is that we should actually give up this comparisons between uh, bilinguals and monolinguals. So using monolinguals as a control group uh, to uh, you know, establish what the differences are between bilinguals and monolinguals and use that as an evidence, as a piece of evidence to defend particular, particular claims. So we should really move away from that. So a bilingual, just this is something that we say all the time, a bilingual is not the sum of two monolinguals. It's not, you know, uh, can't be expected to behave like monolingual in language A and monolingual in language B. So, uh, and this is an important uh, uh, conclusion also, as we'll see in a minute, uh, and I'm about to come to the end of my presentation, as we'll see from the point of view of public engagement. But also, interestingly, because um, there are uh, some studies that are beginning to show that even passive exposure to languages in multilingual communities can actually change aspects of the brain in monolingual, so-called monolingual speakers. So uh, experiments have been done, for example, where monolingual Americans or people who define themselves as monolingual, or oh, I only speak English, I don't know any other language, uh, in California were compared to uh, monolingual speakers uh, in Pennsylvania, central Pennsylvania, and uh, and uh, and then there were control groups, obviously of bilinguals, uh, and everybody had to learn a new new language. The new language was Finnish, which is not particularly easy, um, and uh, and it was found that after a few months, uh, the the there were changes in the brain of the monolingual, so so to speak, monolinguals in California was more similar to the brain of bilinguals than the brain of the monolinguals in Pennsylvania. Although from a behavioral point of view, they didn't find many differences. So we're beginning to, you know, if we're living in increasingly multilingual societies, so the complete monolingual person, you know, where, where are they? Are they on the top of the mountain, uh, you know, in complete isolation? Uh, they're more and more difficult to find. So we should really stop using that as a point of comparison. And finally, uh, understanding multilingualism is important from the point of view of society and from the point of view uh, from uh, you know the point of view of public engagement, science communication. And this is something that I started doing about 15 years ago, uh, partly coming again from my own experience. My own experience as a mother of bilingual children made me very aware of how little people know about bilingualism and how many prejudices there are. 
are out there. And, uh, you know, how many uh, multilingualism is one of those areas where, you know, everybody thinks they know something. It's not like uh, you mentioned, I don't know, astrophysics, and people are ready to say, oh, I don't know anything about astrophysics, but bilingualism, no, I mean, you know, because it's closer to our experience, you know, everybody, uh, think they know, you know, what they should know, and they don't. So it's important to build bridges um, uh, between research and society, uh, not only to distinguish between the many myths out there from some of the facts that are coming out of research, but also increasingly distinguishing between science on the one end and science fiction on the other, because there are some, an increasing number of misreading of misreadings of research that lead to uh, <laughs> fantasy conclusions, you know, like, uh, oh, if you're bilingual, you don't get Alzheimer's, right? I mean, I get asked this question by journalists, for example, uh, or, you know, oh, if, you, if your child grows up with more than one language, they are more intelligent, right? Uh, this is science fiction, and we, it's important, you know, to, uh, to be engaged, to build bridges between research and society. Um, and this is what my center does, uh, Bilingualism Matters, um, does precisely this. And we have many branches around the world. We have 34 at the moment. Most of them are in Europe for uh, obvious reasons, but we have an increasing number uh, of branches outside Europe. And this gives us the opportunity not only to link up research on bilingualism in different contexts, different languages, different political contexts, different societal contexts, um, but also link up uh, joint forces, if you want, from the point of view of public engagement, from the point of view of communication, the most effective ways of uh, communicating research to society, which means, by the way, that we learn a lot as well. So it's not a one-way uh, transmission from wise people to people who don't know. We learn a lot more about multilingualism by talking to general audiences, by talking to parents, teachers, policymakers, health professionals. Uh, so we learn to do better research by doing public engagement as well. Um, so, uh, and this is by, uh, how to get in touch with bilingualism matters. So I'm coming to an end. Um, I started from biographical notes, my own biography, which I think plays a role in the kind of uh, uh, in my interest, my my own research on uh, on bilingualism, but also my uh, my uh, uh, science communication uh, activities. Uh, and by the way, we train researchers, young researchers, to communicate their research in a clear way. And this is a very important fact that uh, we know from feedback. That that we get, um, uh, we've been getting for years, it's something that really matters, no matter what people end up doing, even if they don't have an academic career, being able to communicate in a clear way, adapting your communication to the person or the people you talk to uh, is very important. So we had a look at, you know, bilingualism over the lifespan, linguistic diversity, sensitivity to linguistic diversity and systematic variation, both within in languages, but also across languages. Sensitivity to differences of the bilingual experience that naturally define a continuum of bilingualism that goes from less to more bilingualism and actually uh, uh, discontinues the practice of comparing bilinguals with monolinguals. Um, and a better understanding that ch languages change when they are in contact with one another. That means that the first language changes, uh, uh, naturally changes to different degrees in very specific ways as a result of exposure and practice in an L2 in a second language. Um, and in order to understand all these uh, factors, uh, we need more and more interdisciplinary research because none of us can actually work exclusively within our disciplinary boundaries because um, we are not experts in everything. And many of these phenomena, like the ones that I briefly showed, um, really require an inter understanding the interactions between uh, different factors. So for example, linguistic and cognitive factors. And we, we can do this at best with 
uh, people by working together, by joining forces, both in research and also in science communication when it comes to communicating research to the general public. Um, by the way, uh, I just uh, you know shamelessly uh, want to advertise uh, a, a book that has just come out for Cambridge University Press, and it's called Bilingualism Matters, and uh, it's a book that I co-authored with uh, Maria Garrafa and Maria Wender, and uh, with a kind assistant with the English translation uh, from John Schwitter, and the book is available now uh, from CUP, and I, we cover most of the uh, uh, topics that I mentioned in my presentation. Thank you very much.